Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash, any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still collecting. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. Hello. My name is Clara, but you can call me Mother. And you are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hello, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother, and welcome to the Yutani podcast. Tonight we have a special guest, Brad Tucker, who is a consultant astrophysicist on the movie Alien Covenant. Hi, Brad. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> really good. If people don't know, this is the second time I'm doing a recording with Brad. So there might be some parts where we talk about having spoken about things before. So okay. uh, <laughs> we, we had a dry run. We'll call it that. <laughs> oh, my God. It was a two-hour dry run. <laughs> And thank you for um, indulging me and in recording this again. I'm, I'm having constant technical difficulties, but now with that out of the way. That's right. The great thing about space is there's always technical difficulties. Yeah. You know, as long as you're 10 years not behind schedule and $9 billion over budget, you're doing better than NASA space telescopes. <laughs> oh, so true, so true. Sales deployed. Recharge commencing now. So, just to start off with, Brad, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm uh, an astrophysicist and a cosmologist based in Canberra, Australia, so at Mount Sherman Observatory, which is part of the Australian National University. So my focus is on exploding stars, how this affects the growth of the universe, but I also venture into, the best way to describe it is experimental space technology. So that is kind of crazy ideas and seeing whether they may work or not. Oh, okay. So kind of testing out theories. Yeah, so kind of a good example is most of my research lately has been involved with the Kepler Space Telescope, which died about a week ago now. It ran out of fuel. Uh, and the way we powered it for the past five years, we were, we were actually able to use light from the sun to blow on the space telescope and actually steer it like a sail. So we rotate the spacecraft, use a little bit of thruster firing, and point the solar panel side towards the sun. You can use literally the light particles of the sun to steer or control it. Uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll come up in our conversation today, but you can literally use sunlight to steer stuff in space. How common are suns or stars to be able to fuel that sort of technology to faraway places like, for example, Zeta 2 Reticuli? Yeah, no, it's, it's an emerging thing. There's now an entire project called the Light Sail Project, which is uh, trying to build a, a very thin sail on a probe and use sunlight to steer it. We are actually taking another angle where we're actually trying to use a laser system to blow on it enough and push it out. Because if you can generate enough energy, you can get up to 50% the speed of light. That means you're traveling at 50% the speed of light. Wow, that's amazing. And so, you know, these are literally things that people have developed prototypes now. Um, and actually, interestingly, uh, just last week, while it's a bit far-fetched, there's, a, there's an interesting object in space called Oumuamua. Uh, and this is believed to be the first interstellar comet. Um, oh, that's, so it's that's like, the oh. weird thing that everyone keeps saying is a UFO and it has well, aliens yeah. on it. So it's, it's a very weird shaped comet or asteroid. And so unlike all the other asteroids and comets, it came in kind of at an angle to our solar system. And everything else orbits around in a disk or a circle. And so it immediately got everyone's attention. You know, pretty much everything looked at it because it's such a rare, rare, weird thing. And most recently, uh, uh, a friend of mine and a student, Avi Loeb at Harvard, uh, said, well, you know, this thing is strange. What would a, the light sail technology that we're actually developing here on Earth look like for another solar? Uh, what would it actually look like in space? 
and said, well, if you do some rough calculations, it's not too different from what this thing could potentially be. Now, people don't believe that. There's strong evidence to suggest that it was an old comet. But, you know, we're starting to take these ideas now and actually even, for, you know, backwards portray them into what they would look like in our own solar system and stuff. So they're, they're more than just plausible. They're really generating a lot of ideas now. Wow, that's so fascinating. Like, I, I was very skeptical for it to be something uh, from a, another world. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I heard that it sped up when it had sunlight hit it. And could it be because it melted whatever ice that was there and it therefore it traveled faster? Or did it get a push on? Exactly. That That's exactly the point is, you know, we know this happens with comets. Essentially, it melts. You produce a lot of gas. That gas kind of acts like a, well, a gas propulsion system. Um, but the other thing is what was it that it was a sail and it just kept going on. And this is where it's becoming quite interesting now in this world, a realm. So, you know, some of these more what might seem as outlandish ideas, people are, you know, developing prototypes and working on them as we speak. Fantastic. <laughs> I love it. On that sort of thought process, when we are bit backwards working towards like theoretical stuff that we can test out, what are your sorts of favorite sci-fi movies that kind of do that? The Martian, both the book and the novel. And the reason I say this is not for all the, the detail they go into, which is quite good, that, you know, there's the scene or part of the story where he's digging out Sojourner, kind of the, the first prototype rover on Mars. And a, a scientist at Penn State who works on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, said, hey, you know, okay, Mars, we know, changes its surface. We know sand dust storms. In fact, Mars just recently finished a global dust storm that lasted for three months. So things can get buried up. And so, you know, kind of just did this thought experiment that says, well, all right, what if there was something on Mars in the past? We know Mars was habitable a couple billion years ago. It probably had vast quantities of water and ocean and life forms. You know, it has water right now. So then what would happen if you actually had an advanced civilization on Mars? And the argument is that, well, it's not crazy to think that there could be signs of an ancient civilization that existed on Mars, but it's just completely buried up by the dust and sand on Mars. You think of Pompeii, right? Pompeii, Mount Vesuvius erupts, covers Pompeii. And in only 1900 years on Earth, an entire town civilization has disappeared. And, you know, it takes that time for us on Earth to uncover it. It's not naive to think that this could have happened on Mars. You know, the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, uh, which is about 500 kilometers wide, which is huge, is on Mars. So, you know, we don't have to look far in our solar system to even start thinking that these things could happen. And, and so the reason I bring this up is... By seeing that scene in the movie The Martian, it kind of made him think, what would this actually mean? It's, it's kind of a nice way of seeing something as a, a movie to inspire something. You know, and a lot of people talked about all the technology that's come out of Star Trek and the inspiration from that and, and other things. But here, just by simply seeing the setting, calculating, is this possible? So I've kind of always liked some of these you know, the, these portrayals, because there's always this debate in science fiction, I think, of, of, of accuracy. And I think accuracy is good. And in fact, this is what my experience in alien government has led me to kind of believe, is that accuracy is good, but inspiration is also important. And, you know, Elon Musk has been quoted, and I've, you know, heard them in meetings and conferences, him say this multiple times, you know, a lot of the things he's doing in SpaceX, from the reusable rockets to potential moon and Mars bases and colonies is because, you know, you see it in sci-fi, and it was the inspiration. So we can't let accuracy kind of dictate sci-fi too much, leave it in the fantasy realm a little bit so we have a bit of innovation, you're saying? Yeah, and, and it's I think there's a lot of people you can point to who have had inspiration and innovation from science fiction, and, you know, early portrayals of science fiction and the 
turn of the century and, and also science fiction people, Goddard, who was essentially the one of the first people to create the modern rocket, similar relationship. And you just keep going and seeing time and time again these people who were inspired by science fiction to go pursue science and go pursue these careers and try and do these technologies. So, you know, it's I, I think we need to make sure that right balance is always there because inspiration is an important thing, and that's what science fiction serves. Mm, that's so true. Walter, we have a problem. A neutrino burst was detected in Sector 106. This could trigger a destructive event. Report to the bridge immediately. On my way, Mother. Warning. Power surge detected. Mother, we'll track the energy sails. And channel all power. Emergency. Threat level critical. Let's go on to the sort of stuff you were doing for Covenant. Mm-hmm. Uh, what sort of stuff are you investigating at ANU and how close was the science presented in Alien Covenant to real space research and development? Yeah, yeah. so it's so it, it's interesting. So obviously my role in the film was really only the first kind of 30, 45 minutes. Once they're really on the planet, I don't have a lot to deal with. You know, when the, the, the alien part, let's say, takes over. And, but in fact, it's funny because most of the things in the beginning of the film are so detailed. They're literally detailed based on the things that we are working on. And specifically, I'm working on it. In fact, uh, some of the scenes are actually modeled off little prototypes and images and vision and calculations that li- I and others have literally done. So, um, so firstly, there's the entire, uh, scene that sets up the event, I could say. I assume we can give some stuff away, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. okay. Right, so, so what's called is the, you know, when they, they quote and say, you know, you hear in the ship there's neutrino bursts and you see the wave hitting the covenant ship and it gets knocked off course. Well, so the interesting thing is, so my research is into exploding stars. And so the process of what happens when a star erupts is, is a, there's a sequence. And so the, the star collapses in on itself. And so inside the core of a star, it explodes. Um, so essentially, it's kind of like you take a handful of sand and you squeeze it and you squeeze it and you squeeze it. And then the moment you can't squeeze it anymore, you create a neutron star or a black hole. And as soon as you squeeze as much as you can, your hand bounces off and rebounds. And this produces a shock wave that blows apart the star. But that shock wave keeps going out into space. And in fact, the shock wave leaves the star before the light from the exploding star hit. So if you're going to be near a star that blows up, you would get hit by the shock wave before an explosion. <clears throat> but even before that, neutrinos leave the star. So the moment you're squeezing the star, what is actually happening is you're taking the the uh, atoms and the nuclei of the atoms, and you're breaking apart the electrons. So it's in something we call electron degeneracy pressure. Fancy way of saying you just pull off the electrons and squeeze all the neutrons together to create a neutron star. So what happens in that process is you get a nuclear reaction that releases a bunch of neutrinos. So neutrinos actually leave the star first, then you get the shock wave, then you get the explosion. Oh, I see. Because because Patrick from the Perfect Organism podcast, he wanted to ask, why did they choose neutrinos knowing that they're essentially massless and extremely unlikely to cause any damage? So you're saying it, it was just detecting the shock wave, but the actual explosion of the star was causing the damage. Exactly. So So what happens is you would detect the neutrinos first, which wouldn't do any damage, but shortly thereafter, the shock wave comes, that hits you, mm-hmm. and then hours to days later, an explosion would hit. Okay. Of, like, physical energy. Mm. And, and and we know this. So, in 1987, February 24, 1987, um, a star exploded in what we call the Large Magellanic Cloud. So, this is the neighboring galaxy of the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, a, a 14 solar mass blue supergiant star exploded. And what happened is that... Uh, 
24 neutrinos hit the Earth and were detected. Mm. Eight hours later, the explosion was seen. Wow. Because those neutrinos leave that moment the star collapses down. And yes, all of this is relatively instantaneous, but it still takes minutes to hours for this whole process to happen. Mm. So normally when these things happen, they're so far away, we see it all as kind of one thing because it's millions and billions of light years away. But even something in the large Magellanic cloud, which is over 100,000 light years away, it's multiple hundreds of thousands of light years away, you can still even see a difference from the neutrinos arriving to the explosion. Mm. And so, um, and we know the shock wave happened. So how I got involved in Kepler was, so Kepler is a telescope that's been finding all these planets around other stars. Mm -hmm. I've been using it to find stars that explode. So what happens, so Kepler looks at the same patch of sky every 30 minutes, and this is how it finds all these small planets. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a star that blows up, you will see the moment the star blows up, you'll see it within 30 minutes. And that shock wave leaves the star a few minutes before you see the rest of the light from the star. So if you observe for a constant amount of time and are very sensitive, you can actually see the shock wave leave oh. the star. Because that's actually what Daryl from the Nostromo Files blog wanted to ask as well. Is the neutrino wave really visible to the naked eye? Yeah, so, so what happens is you wouldn't see any neutrinos. You would detect them, mm -hmm. and then you would physically see and feel the shock wave. Wow. <laughs> and, and we've seen this. You know, I've written discovery papers on this with Kepler, and in fact, we even have even more coming out. And so... If you listen to the dialogue, what they say is that there's neutrino burst, which is right. You would detect a burst of neutrinos. So you don't know what from it. Mm -hmm. And then you hit the shock wave hit you. Oh, right. That's, that's just so crazy that you could actually see something like that, even though this thing is massless. You're just seeing the energy it interacts with the things that it's, I guess, bumping into. Yeah, so essentially you see this multi-process thing where you see the, the very beginning, then you feel the shock wave. Uh, you know, so it's essentially the, th the, the three-step process of the star that blows up. Uh, and so, you know, when we were doing the movies, the, you know, obviously projecting a hundred years down the road, and I said, well, if you're on a ship, you would have a neutrino detector because those are the first things you're going to find because they are massless which means they travel near the speed of light. So you would be able to measure them just like in anything. Uh -huh. And you would see them all the time. And if you saw a burst of neutrinos from a direction, you know an event would happen. Yeah. Uh, and it would give you a warning system. I see. So in fact, if you see, you, they say neutrino burst, he looks, then the shockwave hits. Could, could you tell us how far away the ship was? from the explosion, or you don't know? <laughs> we, we estimated that it had to be, obviously, near a star system to be picked up. Mm -hmm. So it was sub-light year distance. I see. All right. That's interesting. So, 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 I think know, they say it's set to 108 is where the shockwave came from. Um, yeah. However... You know, they measure that within the alien universe. That's obviously not the unit of measurement that NASA uses. Oh, yeah. And, well, well, in fact, well, it, it was really just, it was, that was the distance, you know, uh, from the ship, not necessarily from Earth, because they've gone out from Earth, too. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. I, I get it now. <laughs> so, so it's interesting, because, you know, people said, in, in, in fact, you know, when, um, I saw the movie and a few friends knew it worked on it. They're like, hey, you got them to talk about the neutrinos before the explosion. I said, yes, how cool is that? <laughs> we had so many people say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Neutrinos are massless. You know, why would they detect a neutrino? Why would it affect anything? And, and there was a few rants going on on the Internet <laughs> regarding so, that. It's funny because, again, if you pay attention, the neutrino, they just detect the burst because you don't know what the source is. You just see these things. You don't know if it's just a small eruption of a star, the complete destruction, something else, but you would detect them, and at least it would tell you as a warning system, right? Yeah. Um, but in this case, the warning system wasn't fast enough for the actual shockwave from the explosion to hit you. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, that shockwave has been observed. We've done it now 
eight times in, in space. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Up to, we've seen a shockwave from a star that is 1.1 billion light years away. Oh, that's amazing. That's so far. <laughs> it is. So, like, you know, the technology is cool. And so, it, you know, this is like literally my research I got to bring in, which was so cool. <laughs> Reeling her in. Actually, Brad from Aliens Gateway Station, he wanted to ask, was there anything you advised against because the science was too wrong or that was purposely ignored or did they go with whatever you said? So for the most part, they were very responsive during the thing, again, focusing on the beginning scenes. Uh, In fact, the way it happened was they wanted to create a setting where, you know, because the whole point is the ship, everyone's in stasis, the ship is on course for a different system, and they needed some way to get knocked off course. Um, so the entire proposal of how that scene happened was me, was saying this is what could happen, mm-hmm. this is what it would do to the ship. Um, in fact, we didn't mention this, but the entire ship design, the engine, is modeled off a plasma thrust that we're building here. So, oh, so that's real-world technology. Yes. So, and again, if you look at every part of the telescope of the ship, it deploys the sail, which people are working on, including us. And in fact, we use it with Kepler in a different version. And the actual thruster engine is what we call a plasma thruster. So this is using the fourth state of matter. So there's solid liquid gas. There's also a fourth state of matter called plasma. That is, if you superheat a gas... You can pull off all the electrons and create a very ionized, energetic substance. Well, that uh, is very powerful. It's very efficient, but you need to get extra gas and fuel source to create it, which what you would do is har- harvesting potentially with a solar sail. And even the look of the single engine, well, you know, it's multiple engines there, but we have, when we test it, so at here at Mount Shremlo, we have a giant chamber that simulates space. So um, it goes from minus 190 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius, and it creates a vacuum in space. So it's literally like if you're in there, you need a spacesuit to survive. So when we test things like satellites before they go into space, we put it in there. So when we test this thruster engine, we put it in this, and we have videos, equipment to to monitoring the test. Mm -hmm. So we literally, I literally gave them a video of one of our tests of this engine so they can model and scale up into the ship. Wow. So it's pretty much like likeness for likeness. As as much as you can, right? It's (laughs) likeness times a hundred years. Exactly. I see. Well, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, So, so, so all of that was, and again, the ship was what we, we, I suggested. Now, but there was, going back to your question, there was things that they wanted to do that I said no. So a very minor but good example was their original, um, both dialogue and navigation was that they were, they were going to show constellations and saying they were navigating by the constellations. Now, constellations are great. In astronomy, you do not use constellations. And that is because um, stars move, right? Mm-hmm. So the way we see the stars now, even though they appear to be in the same patch of sky, actually have different depths to them. And so they move at different speeds. Uh, <clears throat> so in the course of five to 10,000 years, the stars and the constellations shift. So you would never use them by constellations. What we do in space is we take latitude and longitude and kind of project it out. We move it out as a sphere Ooh. where latitude becomes declination and longitude becomes right ascension. So if you ever hear of a galaxy or star name and it has this really boring telephone number, that <laughs> telephone number is the essentially the space latitude and longitude of it. So you can plug it in into a computer and know exactly where it is. Oh, wow. So anywhere you would navigate would be using this coordinate system, just as we do here on Earth, right? Mm. It's like space GPS. 
So I said, no, you would never do this, and you definitely would not do this on a ship because it's even worse. Um, and so they changed the whole setting, and in fact, in the script, you can hear when they're, they mention the words right ascension and declination. <laughs> that's fantastic. And that's literally the way we do positions in space. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Um, so there definitely was things that, you know, when I said that's not how it is. So they just is, changed they, it. They did it. That's fantastic. That's so good. I, I really hope that they continue this on for the next movies that are, uh, all have space settings because. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's, it, it was interesting because, you know, a lot of this stuff was by taking the knowledge we have now and, you know, saying, okay, again, you take some liberties because it's a hundred years. So yeah, they'd be able to do all this stuff. And it's not naive to think, given our rate of progress, hmm. that all of this is capable. Yeah, uh, the other day I was talking to um, uh, some other alien fans. We're trying to figure out um, when Mars was colonized in the alien universe, which is, mm. I think, the year uh, 2040. They started terraforming, so we had to figure out using the Hoffman transfer and the, the, the 20, 26 month window. Mm-hmm. Every 26 months, you have a window from Earth to be able to tra- uh, to travel tomorrow, to Mars. Yeah. yeah, so we had to figure it, all of that out and what what uh, month they would have to leave and, and what date they'd arrive. And cool. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> but no, it's true. It's All of these little practical things are important and they're real things, right? May 2018 was a great launch window. You know, the next one is July 2020. I think we used uh, November um, 2011 as the because that was the last uh, advertised launch window. So we yeah. calculated from that date, you know, mm. how many months? I think it was like 315 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to figure it out, but yeah, it's just it's just crazy. But um, you know, we we love this sort of thing. We we like to put ourselves <laughs> in this sort of universe and, and use our imaginations. Um, on on that note, uh. What should have, have happened in the space sequences toward the end? Because you only consulted for the opening parts, and you, I heard that you, you didn't uh, help at all with the end uh, physics. Not really. I mean, I, I did help with when they're going down to the planet and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I guess we talked about some of the dynamics on kind of the, the escape scenes. Yeah. Um, and how there that might play out. I think yeah. <laughs> so. It was something like um, the the um, the terraforming equipment falling down, as if it mm-hmm. was falling toward gravity. But if it was in space, wouldn't it just continue to float like the rest of the glass? So the the thing is, though, right? If you notice, the whole time they have gravity on the ships. They've already created artificial gravity. Mm. And so your gravitational field would actually um, stretch out from space too. Oh, okay. So, so it would make sense if the truck were to fall, or, or even if the, the ship was traveling in a certain direction, it would also um, have the truck travel away from the ship. So yeah, it, it would produce a gravitational field. Okay, uh, and, and that was with the, the xenomorph as well. Yes. Jumping around and. Exactly. Sort of and, and, and it's a funny thing, right? Because we hear of artificial gravity and we don't, it was never specifically addressed in the movie, but you see people walking around. So it has artificial gravity. Mm-hmm. And of course, I think it'd be quite easy to find a way of, of solving that. <laughs> and what the consequences are, again, which no movie really touches on is as soon as you gravi- generate a gra- an artificial gravitational well, or potential that generates a little bit of, of a field. So things around the ship even could actually orbit around the ship. Oh, that's interesting. I don't think we spoke about that last time. No, we didn't. And I realized it's one of the points I missed, which is actually related to all the EVA stuff. Oh, yes, of course. Those EVA suits are really cool. <laughs> yeah. And again, modeled off new ones that are being designed. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I, I have heard that they're thinking of creating um, drone robots to do maintenance on, on satellites and, and possibly do mining on asteroids. Yes. 
which is one of my other projects is asteroid mining. Um, <laughs> so, well, no, be, one of the things that most people don't realize is that um, over half of all the astronauts um, have shoulder reconstruction surgery. And that's because the current spacesuits, when they do maneuvers, are too bulky and tear their shoulders. Ultimately, you know, you have this 200 kilogram suit that weighs next to nothing when there's no gravity. But as soon as you go into a gravity or a more gravity environment, it's too bulky and it just tears your shoulder. Ouch, that's tough. So, so a, a major aspect of SpaceX, NASA, ESA, everyone is durable, flexible suits that also provide the heating and insulation and potentially in radiation issues. So, you know, there are a lot of the different models that people are working on. Wow. <laughs> and you would definitely have some sort of HUD screen on it, just as you do in a plane. Yeah, I really liked that sort of um, the light projection. And they've, they've got that technology now. They use yeah. that in um, arcade that, gaming. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that stuff is going to actually going to – I mean, I was almost worried that'd be seen too out of date for looking at in a hundred years, to be honest. <laughs> Perhaps, uh, who knows? Yeah. So yeah, you know, and it's all those little things. We're like, yeah, it totally would. And so with this ship, with the gravity you create, it would produce a gravitational um, field. And so obviously, the further out you go, the weaker it get. But when you're outside the ship and near it, you would still be in the gravitational potential. Ooh. There's geometric data too. Mother, please track the signal to its source. Working. Source of transmission located. Signal originates in sector 87. Right ascension 47.6 and a declension of 24.3 from our current location. She appears to be a main sequence star, a lot like our own. But old, very old. Five planets. Wait, look at that. Planet number four. Planet number four, square in the habitable zone. Prime candidate, in fact. 0 0.96 Gs at surface, oceans, landmass, high likelihood of a living biosphere. It's beyond your most optimistic projections of Orgai 6. How did we miss this? We scanned the entire sector. Riggs, how far is it? She's close. Hell little jump a few weeks wouldn't even have to go back into hypersleep my next question was what sort of cosmic interference could hide a planet because daniels goes to Oram, you know like you know how, how could we miss this you know what yeah. is this planet just magically doing here in, in our path uh how could that happen <laughs> so it's an it, it, and again, this was a, a kind of a probability argument in the sense that, you know, we're pretty good at mapping planets, but ultimately our success rate um, is never going to be 100% mm. in the sense that, um, you know, it's it's kind of that basic idea of photography. You, you know, you can find things, but you have to know where to point to find things. And so, you know, the way stars, planets are found now is we do these massive surveys and look at all these stars and look for these planets, either to transit past in front or do what we call lensing, bend the light, um, or even cause shifts in light. Mm. But if you have a multi-planet system, and more specifically, if you have a planet that is very far out from the star, the way we confirm planets is, let's take the transit method, for instance, so the eclipse method. You pass in front of the star, the planet passes in front of the star, you wait for the light to dip from the star. Mm. Well, in order to find a planet, it needs to go around that star. Mm. So if you're an Earth-like planet and you travel 365 days around, you have to wait 365 days to see it go around. To confirm a planet, we need to know that it happens multiple times and make sure it's actually some sort of binary system or even multiple planets. So you need three transits. So to find an Earth-like planet, you need to wait three times 365 days. Wow, now, <laughs> that's a lot. The, so the further out you go, the longer it takes. So let's take Jupiter, which takes 10 years to orbit the sun. You'd have to wait 30 years to find Jupiter. Pluto, you'd have to wait 340 years to find Pluto. Wow. 
So the idea is if you had a far away enough planet or a slow moving planet, it just could take time to find it. And if you're, you know, you will never have a hundred percent completion rate. So you could just kind of miss it. Unfortunately, it's, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. We are never going to be, you know, we still find stars that we miss. And more importantly, right? Mm-hmm. One of the issues is that, uh, you know, you still have this time scale issue and it's only a hundred years in the future, which is not that far mm-hmm. relative to how things move in space. Yeah. If you think about it, we see all these stars in the nighttime sky, but we know there's actually stuff further out into space in the universe that's actually behind all those other stars. But because they're right behind it, we will never see it in our lifetime because it's blocked. I see. Because it just takes time for these things to move. And it doesn't move on the scale of a 100 years. <laughs> Wow, so we could definitely just miss something like this. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, every, I mean, last two months ago, there was 12 new moons found of Jupiter, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, we still think there's, you know, a ninth planet in our solar system. People think, if I calculated, there could be upwards of 800 dwarf dwarf planets in our own solar system. Oh, my God. There's, you know, space, I don't think we often appreciate just how big space is and how much stuff there is. And so, you know, and this is the classic thing with astronomy. There's so much stuff out there that we know we're never going to find anything, everything. And this, I don't see that changing in the future. Like, there's always going to be more stuff to find. Wow. Yeah, space is huge. Yeah. It kind of pissed me off in Alien Resurrection, where they say that all of space was explored. It's just impossible. No. You know, humans have been broadcasting for roughly 150 years. Mm. Which means our furthest light signals, because radio is light, uh, has gone for 150 years. That means our galaxy, which is 100,000 light years across, we've only gone 150 of those 100,000 years. And so most of the galaxy has not even seen the signals from the 1850s. And in fact, even to get to the other side of our galaxy, it's going to be another over 90,000 years for the very first signals to get there. Oh, my God. It, it, so, is there a place in space where if people looked through a telescope from where they are, would they see dinosaurs? Well, yeah. I mean, there are literally, you know, solar systems or, you know, other galaxies right now are, if they had a big enough and powerful enough telescope and the technology, would be seeing dinosaurs right now. <laughs> There are places in the universe that are seeing the Earth form as we speak. That is crazy. <laughs> right? There are, there are places in the universe that are looking and we don't even, this planet doesn't even exist yet. The star, the sun doesn't even exist. Wow. That's just, and, and, and I think that's the thing. It, it's just so big and it takes time. There is just physically no way to get around these issues. And so you're right with alien resurrection, you know, and they say, you know, they map all the planets. It's like, we think there's two to five trillion planets in our galaxy alone, and there's two trillion galaxies in the universe. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long would it take? So, so I did a calculation once. So if you could say we have 300 billion stars in our Milky Way, which is a rough number, mm-hmm. this is just our galaxy, and you can count five stars a second, it would take you over 15,000 years to count all of the stars in our galaxy. Wow. That's assuming you can count for 15,000 straight years, five stars a second. I and don't have that time. That by two trillion. <laughs> oh, wow. I, um, uh, another calculation that was done by uh, Brad from Aliens Gateway Station on Facebook, uh, he said that the Nostromo ship from the first Alien movie could travel from Earth to Zeta to reticuli in 39 light years over 10 months or nine months. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, so so, so it's, that's that's how fast their ships go, apparently. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Um. All right, so. How how could we conduct tests to test, like, investigate the atmosphere? I know we can send probes and mm-hmm. 
satellites to observe. Uh, do you think a ship as advanced as the Covenant would be able to investigate the livability of planets from so far away? Yeah, and so this is actually what I said was, again, you would have all of this equipment on board, um, and you would be able to do this. I mean, we're pretty much close to doing this now here on Earth. Um, you know, we one of the projects I have is mounting telescopes to high altitude balloons, and you can actually observe in the ultraviolet colors. You can actually even detect um, the atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere, rain, cloud systems, you know, all sorts of things. And so, you know, that is more than possible. Can we currently detect life forms, or do we need samples to be able to confirm that? So this is, we can detect biosignatures. Mm-hmm. We can detect things that are byproducts of life. I think it's very possible that we'd be able to detect the, the compositions that would be built into a biological form. Mm-hmm. And so a ship would be able to have that. It would be able to test, you know, what is the composition of the atmosphere? Is it breathable? Is there anything else? Is there anything really unknown? It'd be able to monitor the magnetic interference, be able to measure storms, weather systems, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah totally easy. Wow. Um, so it, in regards to, like, this, these planets being terraformed in the alien universe, what, what would be required to terraform a planet? So, and this is interesting. In fact, the Mars point that you had earlier is interesting is, um, you know, you need uh, um, a lot of both oxygen and CO2. Mm-hmm. The other trick you need that most people forget is that the planet must have a magnetic field. And so that is that on the inside of every planet, every star is iron, mm-hmm. usually some sort of melted iron core. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even Jupiter actually has a solid core in it. Mm-hmm. And so this iron generates magnetism. And so this m- creates this magnetic bubble or shield that prevents radiation from getting into it. So not so that would need be needed to sustain an atmosphere, and then you'd have to generate an atmosphere that has oxygen and, and also carbon dioxide for both stuff to breathe and plants to breathe, uh, and then that process would have to take. Um, and someone actually did a calculation to show that on Mars, there's not enough CO2 to actually terraform Mars. Ah. Because you would never be able to create enough sustainability based on the strength of the atmosphere and the CO2 held in that atmosphere to actually create a sustainable ecosystem. Uh, this is kind of a, a recent paper that came out, which is quite cool. So, you know, those are usually the components that you need. And so terraforming is one of those things where I don't even know if it's ever going to be possible because of just the the effort involved because I think there's always a simple equation here. It's all about economics. You know, it's one of those things that people don't realize that it's driven by economics. There's a lot of things possible, but is it economically beneficial? And so you could say that you could terraform something, or if you already have the technology, you just go to a planet that is habitable because they're so common. Mm. Right? So you would just go find a place that you can live because it's way easier. The Fermi Paradox. I was looking this up the other time uh, when, when yep. we were talking. Could you explain uh, to me and, and to other people uh, how that affects us in regards to discovering other life or leaving the planet? Yeah, so it's um, so for those who don't know the Fermi Paradox, it says that, um, and this was created by Enrico Fermi, a, a famous physicist, that says, if life is going to be so common, why haven't we found it? There's a lot of interesting solutions to this problem. One, it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, that light takes time to travel. So, you know, even if someone detects our first signals now, they're not going to reply for 150 years. So it's slow. Same thing with us looking at other planets. 
and again, you know, these planets are more more likely to see dinosaurs. In fact, if they're ever likely to come here, what's more likely to happen? Does it come in the four and a half billion years we're not here, or the two billion years humans are here, or even more rare, the hundred years modern society is here? Right? It's kind of a numbers game. But then there's even other ideas like, well, okay, those are some numerical ideas, but what if there's a point where civilization ultimately destroys itself? You know, and, it, and it's a hard argument not to make, right? We see both effects environmentally, weaponization, all those sorts of things, where you could say that potentially we outpower ourselves and destroy ourselves. And maybe there's this point that this happens civilization. Mm. And the other thing is, well, maybe the reason we haven't been, we haven't found aliens. What if we're an experiment? What if, in fact, there is another civilization and it's called the alien zoo hypothesis, mm-hmm. where we're kind of this intergalactic zoo that someone's monitoring, or even more fancifully, a simulation, a, com- a giant computer simulation. <laughs> you know, it's kind of Matrix style, right? So you can, you know, modern computers have been around for 40 years. Mm-hmm. In 40 years, we've gone to pretty, you know, AI is a very useful thing that's used all the time. Mm-hmm. And our modeling is just out of this world. So what's not to say that you give a civilization another hundred years beyond us and they're able to create an an exact simulation that creates our experience? It's hard to argue that's not (laughs) possible. It's true. Yeah. We haven't found it. You know, and and so there's a lot of these solutions to it where it's kind of like, yeah. And so I always tell people this, that I believe in aliens. I believe I, as I say, we will find evidence of life, and it's going to be, you know, bacteria in the first instance or something like that, Mm. before humans are on Mars. Both because of how close we're getting to that question, and but also because how hard it is to get humans into space. Humans in space do not mix well. Yeah, there's a bit of madness that goes with it. It's like being uh, on a on a deserted island. Or yeah, the, the psychological and medical effects of astronauts and space traps are, are hard on the body. And you know, and then and then building into that, um, I, I just think there's, you know, two to five trillion planets in our galaxy, 20 or so billion planets that are Earth-like and probably habitable. Every, there's planets everywhere, and that's not even the moons. You know, you look at Europa and Titan and um, and Saladas, uh, you know, moons and Ju- of Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system, which have more water than we do here on Earth. You know, Titan has 11 times the water that Earth does. Wow. It, it, they're just rich in water. So there probably is life right there now. And, you know, so there's all these moons that potentially have life. Pe- we've landed probes on comets, 67P, and found amino acids. Everywhere we look, there's signs of it. So if there's all this stuff in space and all these galaxies, all these planets, all these stars and all this possibility, and yet we are the only place where life has evolved, that quite answer scares me. Mm. Not the, oh, life is just everywhere and it's just a common thing, just as planets are common, just as stars are common. Mm. That makes sense. But if we are the statistical fluke, that is more than a fluke. Wow, I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> and, and, and that answer generally, worry isn't necessarily the right word, but I, I think is more troubling and perplexing than, uh, okay, life is just common and it takes time to evolve. Mm. And we're only now looking. You know, I don't think people appreciate that we only, the first planet around another star was only found 27 years ago, 28 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, it wasn't until the 90s. Uh, late 80s, that really the first planet around another star was found, the first exoplanet. It's not actually that long. What's the name of that planet? Um, well, so I guess there's there's two, if you want to call it. So there's 51 Pegasi B, uh, and this was the the first kind of, I guess, habitable planet, if you want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the very first one, so that was in 51 Pegasi B was, um, in 94? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 94, I think. So even later than that. Um, sorry, 95, yeah, 95. But then there was actually before that 1992, there was a planet discovered around a pulsar, um, pulsar 1257. And pulsars are these neutron stars that have these giant magnetic fields. So that planet's terrible. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But so the very first planet was 92. Um, so 26 years ago. Um, and the, uh, really the first real kind of planet people cared about was 95. Um, so 23 years ago. So, you know, it's only a generation that we've actually known of planets around other stars. Wow. And so yeah, we always believed it, but we didn't know how common were they are. And now that they're just common, and the exception to the rule is not to have one, what's to say the same thing about life? <laughs> that spins me out. <laughs> mm. Breathing her in. I also wanted to ask, uh, on behalf of Daryl Curtis of the Nostromo Files blog, he was asking, what exactly did the sails capture that powers the Covenant? Is, is it solar power? So, so it's not actually quite solar power. The idea is you would actually um, um, use both the light as a pressure um, for the sail and then expelled hydrogen gas that you can then... Um, collapse down and turn into a plasma. Oh, so it's actually plasma powered. Yes, yeah, so the idea is the solar powers would create the plasma reaction for the plasma engine. Oh, well, that's pretty high tech. <laughs> but, but that's how we're, you know, that's literally what the plans are right now. Uh, in fact, you know, everyone, you know, I don't think people realize that what's called the gateway, uh, this is going to be the moon space station, is already being built, and it, the first parts will go up in 2022. Um, so, you know, we'll see a moon space station in four years, and people want to harvest hydro, um, the ice of the moon and helium-3 because that's what you can use for plasma. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so, and again, again, just stuff that people are working on. And it's, it's all happening very soon. That's amazing. It is, and, and I think that's kind of the cool thing is, you know, space has undergone this rapid evolution, that I don't even think we can appreciate how fast it's moving. And so, you know, all of this stuff, which is just stuff we're working on now, is just mind-boggling. <laughs> it is. Wow, that's it's just amazing. I'm, I'm really happy that it's all happening in my lifetime because I would be it so is. sad to miss it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I always say we kind of live in the sci-fi age where these things are real, you know, and... and People, you know, we as we speak, there are, you know, these rovers roaming around this asteroid, digging it up uh, on this mission Hayabusa 2, which is this Japanese mission, which uh, is also Australia's participating in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's collecting all these rocks and, and, and metals. And then at the end, they're all going to hop back in the main body. The body, uh, the probe is going to release 10 kilograms of C4 to, to detonate an explosion on the asteroid. It's going to collect all that material, and all of that's going to land back in South Australia in 2020. Wow. So, so it, would that be considered a mining mission, or would that be considered uh, like just getting cool samples? It's it's a scientific m- mission, but the technology it's a technology demonstrator too. Oh. You know, there's a Cyrus Rex, which is the NASA mission which instead of landing is going to drill this arm down and take samples all the way down, um, that approaches the asteroid Bennu in three weeks' time. <laughs> That's so and cool. And it will land in Utah. That's so great. I, I had a, I, I kind of had a debate slash argument with my husband this morning about whether they're actually mining asteroids yet. And he's like, if they're taking core samples, that's not mining. Like, we're talking about, you know, commercial 
Agreed. So <laughs> it's, I mean, we have, we've developed an asteroid mining mission and we are, and you know, there's 20 or so private companies doing asteroid mining, mm-hmm. developing prototypes. So we're not there yet, but we're close. You will see in the next decade. Wow. Asteroid that's mining. so cool. Um, back to the movie, uh, mm-hmm. sure signal. So Bradley at Alien, Get- Aliens Gateway Station wanted to ask, why did the Covenant need a com- communication Japner that only allowed Tennessee to pick up the signal once he went EVA, so off the ship? So can you just say that again? <laughs> so why was it that Tennessee could only pick up Shaw's yeah. signal when he was away from the ship? And and the communication so, dampener was, was down up, up because of, like, the power. Right. So you generate... um. Uh, you you would generate electrical EM interference. So what would happen is you would generate your own electrical magnetic interference, uh, and you'd have to find a way around it. And you'd also be generating that gravitational field, uh, and you're collecting your solar sails, which produces a gas, which is plasma, which is ionized, which produces its own interference. Right. So so it would. Just, you just have to protect all of the instruments, basically, yeah. from all of this interference. It's kind of like planes do, where we have to yeah. turn off our mobile mm. phones and stuff mm. like that. This is shielding and all that stuff happens all the time in space. Um, we even have special sticky tape for space that <laughs> doesn't that doesn't transfer electrical magnetic properties, so it doesn't create extra interference. Because even duct tape does. That's crazy. But was it like, the same sort of tape they used to plug that hole? In the yes, ISS? Exactly. <laughs> like, we have rolls of special sticky tape. That is space sticky tape. Um, and so it's, it's funny because all these little things matter in a perfect vacuum environment, which is space. Because the, the radiation field, the electrical magnetic field, the gravitational field, you know, it all pervades out into space. Um, and so you have to be like perfect. And, and, it, and it's funny because I, I never really appreciate it until you started testing satellites. You know, every satellite goes through a process called shaking mm. so or vibration testing. So everywhere, and we have one at where we work because we test satellites, you have this giant table that just shakes a satellite. <laughs> because, because if something comes loose, a soldering point comes loose or whatever, you can't fix it. And on the rocket launch, the vibrations can shake stuff apart. So it's kind of like this perfect environment um, creates its own difficulties. And in fact, one of the things that people don't appreciate is that we all think of space as being cold, which is true. But we also have a problem keeping space too hot. So, right, when you have solar energy or sun, for instance, when you're in orbit, mm-hmm. you go from being very cold to very hot instantaneously. Because you don't have the Earth's atmosphere protecting exactly. you. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. So things not only have a problem being very cold, they have a problem being very hot. So you have to build it for both being hot and cold. So that's why it looks like the astronauts are in so much padding, because it's just yeah. all temperature control. It is, exactly. <laughs> that's amazing. Um so, with the, the design of the Covenant, um, the overall ship, were you aware that it looks kind of like the Discovery from 2001, A Space Odyssey? Yeah, and, and I think there's there's a couple things, right? So, the engine was purely based on what we have. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think there was, um, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey also went through its own process of trying to be very accurate, right? Yeah, they had... To space scientists as well. Yeah. And, and, and one of the, I guess, the simple things is that kind of aerodynamics and flow rates in space don't change. And so some of the basic principles would be the same. Um, right. It's <clears throat> maybe a good example of this is most people don't realize that the Russians built their own version of the U.S. space shuttle. And it was never quite ready, and then the fall of the USSR caused it. They had a very similar 
design like the U.S. space shuttle. Like, it looks like the U.S. space shuttle. Mm-hmm. Not because they were copying it, because that was what they realized the aerodynamics looked like. Um, even the new um, Orion capsule, which is kind of the new replacement for the space shuttle, looks a lot like the Soyuz and the Apollo capsule. So you kind of end up in this circular problem where in some ways we can improve things, but in other ways the tweaks are the same. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, like you tweak it, but the basic things are going to be um, like the, the same view. And, and I, I really think um, the, uh, the legacy here is that um, – 2001 Space Odyssey, I think, was just, like, it was done really well. You know, and as you said, they had two people working on it, and they took a lot of advancements and, and, you know, a lot of style to it. And so, you know, the way that bridge is constructed in it it was similar. But the engine is all what we did modeling. And and, and the front is different from Discovery, though. Yeah. Discovery was this really round, ball-shaped thing, Mm -hmm. where this is more that... Plain space shuttle style. Yeah, like very, it looks very aerodynamic, kind of like yeah, the exactly. front of a train, which is, a train yeah. looks exactly the same as nearly the the spaceship because it's long and it's aerodynamic yeah. and. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I heard that um, Ridley wanted it to look like a train, and I, I think it it was because of um he's kind of basing Alien Covenant on a, a couple of different storylines, but one of them is. Lawrence of Arabia. Have you watched Lawrence of Arabia? Yes, I have. Yes. yes. Yeah, so yeah. the the um the the train being blown up by the electronic device. That that's what the um neutrino burst was to the Covenant. So. Apparently. Uh, okay. <laughs> um. Okay. So, uh, Daryl Curtis from the Nostromo Files blog. Uh, he wanted to ask, uh, how would the Covenant have been? reconfigured for landfall upon reaching Aurigai 6. Uh, was the command section capable of landing? Do you know that sort of thing? Or We didn't really get into that, no. Um, no, th- so to be honest, that was not something we really got into. Mm, okay, that's cool, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I don't have a good answer for that one. Well, I, I, I think that they would have just taken it apart in space and then used... Yeah. The, the lander as a tow machine. Well, it is, and, and it was something, like, you know, so the, what happened when we were doing, I was doing this film, is in the very beginning of this process, I kind of had both a, essentially I did a, like a three-hour crash course in astrophysics and space for the team mm. um, to talk about kind of what things are going on, what's possible. And we did talk about, um, exactly what SpaceX is planning, which is this, where the quickest way is to assemble things in space, take it out, and then disassemble when you get there. Mm. Um, because all of the energy needed is to get on and off the planet because of gravity. Yeah. So um, you could not do it in one go. So you do it, you take things up in loads, you assemble it, you take off, and you come back. Um, and so I, as you as exactly what you said, that's probably the view that they employed. Mm. So, so they'd be able to take the entire space station or part, or, or at least maybe keep a section of it up there. So that in fact, be... you, would, you would probably keep the, the the hole where everyone is actually just in orbit, because that's the cheapest link. Ah, yes, that's true. So any incoming spaceships would be able to just dock there and then kind of yeah. do it. There's kind of like an interchange, like a, a gateway. Yeah, which is exactly what's being built in around the moon. <laughs> Fantastic. Brad from Aliens Gateway Station wanted to ask, what sort of solid rocket fuel stores would the Covenant have needed to provide the lander with the emergency thrust for a sustained period to escape gravity? Yeah. So, again, we went all into the idea of both using a mixture of of, a plasma uh, thruster-style engine Mm -hmm. um, and then one based on you would use helium-3, which is way more efficient than hydrazine, which is the more common solid rocket fuel. I see. So hydrazine is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. It's a it's an isotope, essentially. It's a version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas helium-3 is quite good. It's 
better. Essentially, you move up the, the element chain. Mm-hmm. Hi, helium-3, the reason we don't use it on Earth is it's rare. We're actually running out of helium on Earth. Um, helium-4, which is a normal helium, and helium-3, we're actually really, really low on because it's very useful for everything. One of the, again, the big things about the moon is the moon is rich, very rich in helium-3, especially on the back side of the moon, mm. the far side. Um, so the sooner we colonize that, the more, the, the higher the possibility of um, oh, yeah. long-distance space travel, uh, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why everyone wants to get to the moon, is to use it as a fuel stop to get out to further in the solar system. Mm-hmm. Like, that is the reason people are going back. So Chang'e 4... Um, which is a Chinese rover, is landing on the back side of the moon in December. Oh, that's amazing. Mm. That'll be really cool. And, so, and it's funny, like, you know, it's funny all these questions. This is literally the problems that people are trying to solve right now. Because <laughs> um, helium is a very useful <laughs> noble gas. Mm. Um, essentially, it's the simplest noble gas, which means anytime you need something like that, that's why you use it. But it's just hard and expensive. Ah, um, I was wondering, back to the movie again, uh, would a ship as big as the Covenant be able to stay 80 kilometres above the planetary storm? And what sort of propulsion technology would it need to maintain that sort of orbit? So so um, 80 kilometres, again, uh, is not necessarily random. So this is what we call the Carsman line. Mm-hmm. This was calculated where where is the height that you can sustain an orbit, um, and that and it's right in the depending on the atmospheric conditions, it's anywhere between on Earth 82 to 85, all the way up to 110 kilometers. And so once you're at those heights, you can sustain an orbit with very little extra thrust. Wow. Um, so. In at 80 kilometers, it's pretty easy to actually stay above a planet. You still have atmospheric drag, so you still need to do thrusters, but even the International Space Station does that. Wow, okay. So, in fact, um, it was, you know, in, in April, we saw Tiangong 1, which is the Chinese space station, come crashing back to Earth. Mm. That's because they lost control of their thruster system, and the at- so the atmosphere continues on Earth for about 3,000 kilometers. Oh, okay. It's very thin, doesn't it really exist, mm. but it creates just enough drag to slowly pull on the orbits of satellites. So everything always requires a little bit of a boost. Uh. And so the closer you are to the planet, the more boosting you need, um, which is always the trick. But it doesn't require that much. Um, and in fact, the International Space Station's fine, but at some point, the International Space Station's come crashing back to, to the Earth. I see. Right. So, it's again, it's one of those things, everything already does it in space, you just don't really pay attention to it or don't hear about it, Um, because it's there, but everything has thrusters attached to it. That's why everything has a limited lifespan for the most part. I see. Right. Um, What else? There was something I was going to ask. I was going to ask about the biology of Planet 4, but I actually spoke to a biologist the other day, and they gave me an answer. Um, so I'll just add that onto the blog. Uh, I can, I can forward you the email as well. If yeah, you like. yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so I'll answer that, uh, in a different way. So just, uh, the listeners just go to the blog and, and read the answer there. Nice. Um, for the juggernaut. So, uh, Bradley again wanted to ask, uh, what do you think the juggernaut's propulsion system or aerodynamics are? Because it, it, it's a, a U-shape, but it goes curved side forward. But when it's landing, it goes pointy sides forward. <laughs> yeah. So this was, a, again, you know, not something I necessarily had involved with it. Um, you know, I remember we, we were debating about this. It's strange, right? Because it it doesn't make sense. Obviously, the, the curved surfaces... You know, that's that's aerodynamic and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but you're right, it kind of lands this this weird shape. And, and I guess ultimately, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very efficient system mm. to me. Because 
so when we see it in in this uh, like short movie called The Crossing, mm-hmm. um, it's actually it's going uh, curved side forward, but then it's kind of spinning like a whisk. Right. But it's going. It seems like it's going very slowly, but I, I don't know what relativity is in, in regards to the speed. It could be going really really fast, and we don't know. Um, so yeah, it's just it's alien technology. There's no answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think it's one of those things that you can chalk it up to uh, uh, alien <laughs> technology. Yes, <laughs> that's fair enough. Thank you for uh, indulging us anyway. <laughs> no, it's funny because it was funny. It was one of the things that someone's like, yeah, okay, I don't know about that one. But uh, <laughs> I guess you've already put that in your film, so you can't take it out. <laughs> um. Okay, so let, let's talk about the, the lander. So we yes. spoke about the Covenant. We're going to speak about the dynamics of the lander. Um, so uh, Brad, again, he's from Alien Gateway Station, wanted to ask, outside of your consultancy, uh, the cargo ship that Tennessee flew, could it really be capable of that sort of manoeuvrability in the lower atmosphere while trying to shake off an alien? <laughs> So, you know, and again, one of those things where it depends on your atmospheric pressure. So for the most part, it they measure a pressure uh, and therefore a uh, pressure gradient, as we say, you know, going from decreasing atmosphere to more atmosphere, similar to Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in, in the lower atmosphere, we see fighter jets and do this all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, ultimately, what always becomes the trick is as long as you have a hole that has a strong material um, that can sustain it, that's fine. Mm. And so this is often a part of the films that are always missed, and it was never we never directly addressed it. The movie never directly addressed it. But I said, look, if you're still traveling through interstellar space and even planetary space, you're going to encounter micrometeorites. You're going to encounter little bits of stuff, mm. and that's actually a problem that no one ever talks, touches on. So everyone assumes it's small, it's fine. A good example is the, the issues we have with space junk, mm. in that um, space debris, stuff that we've put around the Earth, rocket boosters, all this sort of stuff, create problems. But it's also the small things. A good example was um, the bulletproof glass of the space station got a hole that was about five centimeters deep, and this hole was caused by a flake of paint. Wow. It's literally a piece of paint off something created a hole in bulletproof glass five centimeters deep because it's traveling 40 to 80,000 kilometers an hour. So what I I told them, and and I also tell people this, is if you're traveling really at very fast speeds, which these ships do, the smallest piece of mass will create a very huge amount of energy. And so... If you were traveling through anything, if you get hit by anything, the current way ships are built is, it's dumb. <laughs> and sure. Yeah. So you have to have a very tough um, type of material mm. in order to sustain it. And I assume um, that's what they thought the ship and the lander would be because it would – Create the lander would have even more problems because it's guaranteed to be running into stuff. Mm-hmm. And again, the lander is not just for when you're on the planet, but as you saw, it detaches in the atmosphere. Um, so it's supposed to travel like a space shuttle, right? So the lander we have to think about is like the space shuttle. And so it has to be built tough. It has to be able to built for reentry. It has to be maneuverable like a plane, just as a space shuttle was. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. Forward engine. I wanted to ask about the thrusters. Mm-hmm. If it's, it's burning a sort of plasma, or, or we're assuming that the lander is yeah. primed for a plasma mix or something, Tennessee says something like that to Daniels. Yeah. How hot would it be that the alien just seems to walk right through it? it it's yeah, slightly so it bothered be, by it, but... It would be very hot, which is... Um, 
plasma, the reason people like it, it's very energetic, therefore it's very, very hot, so to speak. Um, also magnetic. So, you know, they knew this, and I guess the decision was that the alien would survive it. I see. So, like, so it, how hot roughly have you, have you got a... That's for sure. The, what rough measurement would it be? Would it be the equivalent of a, a rocket booster? Oh, it, ho- hotter. Hotter? Oh, wow. Okay. That's crazy. So, so <laughs> plasma can get hundreds of degrees Celsius. I see. Wow. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so it, I, again, you know, that part wasn't necessarily um, <laughs> me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would be very hot. I mean, there's some plasmas. I just want to quick it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can get, you know, tens of thousands of degrees. Wow. Right. I mean, the sun is a plasma. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wow, so the, the alien's pretty pretty hardy now, isn't it? <laughs> and I think that's probably why they maybe sh- did that, is to show that, you know, this isn't, this is the alien, right? Yeah. It's it's really hardcore, you can't kill it easily, etc. Exactly. I see. Wow. Um, maybe, I, I mean, this is all speculation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. And who knows, it could change in the next movie, that's how, it, how things go. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, I've got uh, one more question because we already addressed the weightlessness and the final mm, yeah, scene, yeah. and you know that's all all good. Um, what did you think about the movie? That's that's all I would like to ask. <laughs> yeah. Did you enjoy it? Look, I I get, one of the things, and this is kind of when we're starting in the beginning, is going in. I really wanted to be accurate. Mm. And then I kind of realized, you know, it's what we talked about, inspiration. Inspiration is an important thing. And yes, even though Alien Coven is, you know, a different sci-fi film from, say, The Martian or Interstellar or some of these more recent ones, mm. we still have to be cognizant that inspiration is there, even even in something like this, even as something is... You know, Star Wars, Star Trek, some of these other great sci-fi means, uh, 2001. And so, I, I felt we should have been more inspirational. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I generally, I, I thought it was nice to see some of the things that we worked on on the screen come together. You know, putting the movie together, I, you don't know how it's gonna look like and what's gonna make the scenes and what's not and, you know, um, how it's really going to come together at that end. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I, I appreciated it because it allowed, you know, when I talk, and I, you know, I do a lot of public talks and stuff like that, and I always try and bring in movies because that's what people know. People get their information through popular mediums. And so people don't know the space junk problem, but they know gravity and they know it can create a problem. And so you give, you get talking points and you get ways to start the conversation to get people's brains jogging and thinking and moving. So even something like Alien Covenant, I could say, you know, hey, did you see this? Well, you know, it's actually kind of like that. Oh, that's cool. Um, or, you know, like the question's here, but why is that the case? You know, there's never, if I were to go and propose someone, and say, I want to talk about the way um, a gravitational field can permeate space by something that's artificially creating gravity, everyone would tune out. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Say, to answer the question why this happened in the movie, it's the same exact conversation. Mm. And so it, it provides these doors of explaining what people are doing in science in all fields. Uh, in a very cool manner that is, you know, uh, I think we're, I am lucky to have. And so, you know, regardless of how, I guess, uh, what other people think, how the movie turned out or whatever, I like these, these chances to, to capitalize on. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and show it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice way of talking about science. Yeah. I, and it's an easy way to, 
have people picture these sorts of yeah. sequences and things happening, and, and it's easier for people to relate to. Exactly, because, you know, you, you can't go and give them a, a crash course in gravitational physics, right? That's not going to happen, mm. or how plasma is created. But you just have to, you know, you have to find that common ground, and, and sci-fi ends up being that common ground. <laughs> it's uh, it's quite interesting, because you were mentioning that you really liked um, The Martian. The, mm. the author of the book actually wrote a paper on continuous thrust. Uh, so there's a section in the movie where uh, this guy is walking around the room holding a pen and showing yeah. how the, the ship would travel. Uh, the guy actually wrote a paper on that. Mm. <laughs> it did all the calculations. Well, in, in uh, the, the Interstellar, right, mm-hmm. uh, Kip Thorne, who worked in Interstellar, is the only person I know who's won a Nobel Prize in Physics and an Oscar. Wow. <laughs> because, and in fact, the modeling, and so I, I'm friends with the people who did the modeling of the black hole gargantuan, mm-hmm. and they led to two discoveries on black hole physics through that movie because they did it so right. And so, yeah, it's these interesting things that happen where people want to do it for fun, and yet now the fun is driving the science, and that goes back to that inspiration. I love that. Uh, and I also love Interstellar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just one thing uh, before I go, and thank you so much for recording with me again and, and dealing with all the technical no, difficulties. That's all right. yeah. There's a few issues along the way. I apologize for that, too. Oh, there must be, like, close to 100 emails between us. <laughs> it, it, it was it was comical, some of the things that happened, and, and I apologize it took so long, but, yeah, oh, gosh. Things like uh, our kids. Uh, there was a fire last week. So yeah, we had a we had a bushfire uh, eight kilometers from the observatory. That's right. They have, and we've already burnt down in 2003, so we're a bit worried. Oh jeez. Oh. Yes, Mount Stromlo had, was mostly burnt down in 2003. Um, we hold a record for the largest insurance claim in Australian history. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so <laughs> it's a bit uneasy. Yeah. Uh, a Soyuz rocket failure? Yes, so so the Soyuz rocket failure, the, there was something wrong when the boosters were breaking away, the Korolev That's Cross. Right. Usually it's all synchronized and you can watch this Korolev Cross, which I will post the videos of a perfect yeah, one. Did you, did you, have you seen the video from Roscosmos? Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah, and you can just clearly see it doesn't detach right. Yeah, so, so it was just too dangerous to keep going, so they just had yeah. to abort mission. And... and that's that's one of the things that people have a lot of problem with with alien movies, which is kind of funny because you're, you've got the science fiction, and fiction is part of the word. Yeah. That these bad things happen, like oh, you know, these humans are doing making yeah. these dumb decisions and doing these dumb things. Well, when we were talking about detecting life on planet, um, a planet, you know, yeah. what if they don't have instruments that could detect dormant life, like spores, yeah. which only react once there's some sort of uh, exactly. interaction with uh, live species, you know. We we are only limited by we. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of the problem. We make mistakes, things happen, things go wrong, you know. And so that's going to happen in the sci-fi world in the future world too. <laughs> and it happens in space right now. It, it happens in space right now. There's space sticky tape on the space station. <laughs> There's paint flex making, you know, boring holes in the image. Yeah. Two say. satellites, and most people don't realize in 2009, a Russian Cosmos satellite crashed into Iridium satellite communication phone satellite. Whoa, really? It's the first collision between two satellites. Oh my gosh. And it's, it's getting happen. pretty crowded up there as it well. It is. And, and it's, it's funny. It's, I, I don't jokingly say we live in this sci fi age where all this stuff that's happening in film, where it's happening in film and Movies and books and TV is literally real life, and some of it's now outdated. It's just amazing. <laughs> it's mind-boggling. <laughs> Thank you again so much for coming on to uh, Utani oh, Podcast. My pleasure. <laughs> And uh, I would like to say I would love to have you on again, but you're such a busy man. 
<laughs> no, we'll have to find a time and again. No, we we should have time again in the future. Yes, uh, well, I'm sure my schedule's not always that hectic. It just we always <laughs> had secrets. I don't know. It was comical. <laughs> <laughs> well, just flick me an email when you're not busy, and we'll catch we'll up do. again, and we can talk any other sci-fi or space or or any any innovations. That would be great. Definitely. Lovely, Definitely. lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much, and. This is uh, Mother signing off and, and Brad Tucker, the astrophysicist. <laughs> Thank you. This is Colony Ship Covenant reporting. All crew members apart from Daniels in Tennessee tragically perished in a solar flare incident. All colonists in hypersleep remain intact and undisturbed on course for Orgai 6. Hopefully this transmission will reach the network and be relayed in six years. You can now support Yutani Podcast on Patreon and subscribe to yutani.blog to stay up to date.